Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Udang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami. <clears throat> so, uh, can everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay. <clears throat> I'm pretty new with microphones, so. <clears throat> so, um, as uh, Ajahn Kovalo just said, my name is Ajahn Nando, and um, I'm originally from Canada, but I've lived the last uh, 17 years in Thailand and a bit in Australia. Um, this will be my 15th, I'm 15th reigns right now as a monk, and this year will be my 16th. And um, in all the time I've, I've been away, been in Thailand, I've only ever come back to North America twice to visit family in Canada. This is the second time, and this is my first time in Seattle. Um, the last time I was in mainland America was... Uh, Back in the 90s, I went to go visit Fargo once. So uh, <laughs> so ev everything here is pretty new to me. Also, teaching a large group of Westerners is pretty new to me, too. Um, so uh, um, when I was thinking of maybe what I should talk about today, one of the questions I've been, or some of the questions I've been getting from people lately are, you know, people will ask me, you know, I've been meditating for, many years and I don't feel I've gotten anything in my practice. I don't feel I've gotten anywhere in my meditation. Or people also ask me like, you know, I've been meditating, but how do I, how do I take my meditation deeper? Like, how do I take my meditation to the next step? <clears throat> so the way that we would do this, and which is um, uh, a set of practices, which is very heavily emphasized in the Thai forest tradition are what are called the Apanika Dhammas. So these are known as like the teachings that are always right and never wrong. And um, there's three of them. The first one is Indriya Sangwara, which is sense restraint. The second one is Bojane Matanyuta, which is moderation in eating. And the third one is Jagaryanu Yoga, um, which is devotion to wakefulness. So Again, for us, you know, these really form the core and the heart of our practice as forest monks. And these really um, make the difference between um, how deep you want your meditation to be. So you could kind of compare it to, <clears throat> you can compare it to someone who's exercising and, you know, wants to get fit. So, you know, if you have someone who really wants to get in shape, wants to get that real, you know, the gym body, the abs, the muscles, everything, um, you can compare uh, the difference to someone who just goes to the gym and their whole, their whole fitness routine is just, they go to the gym once a day, they lift their weights, do their exercise there, but then um, outside of the gym, they just do whatever they want. They just eat junk food. You know, they go out and drink and party. They don't get enough rest um, versus someone who um, they make fitness their whole life. So not only do they go to the gym, but they eat it, they eat healthy food, they live an active life, they make sure to get enough proper rest. So um, so uh, following the uh, Apanika Dhammas is like the ladder. It's like making your, your practice a whole life practice and a holistic practice. And this is gonna maximize the results um, within our practice. <clears throat> but with these things, you know, they take time and they're not, not practices we can just do once and then get the results. We have to do them over, over a period of time, and then we'll uh, start to see the results from them. And when practicing them, we'll also see a lot of our attachments and a lot of the, the our kilesas coming up. So the the first one is indriya sangwara, which is sense restraint. So um, you can break this up into two uh, two uh, two different types. Um, so one is limiting the amount of uh, sense contact we have, limiting, limiting the amount of things which come in through our senses. And the second one would be um, what's known as guarding the sense doors or having mindfulness um, 
when we do have sense contact. Um, <clears throat> so as most people probably know in Buddhism, um, we have six senses and we have their corresponding objects. So you have you know, the eye, you have sights, you have the nose, smells, tongue, tastes, ear, sounds, the body, uh, contact or touch, and the mind and mind objects. So um, where we start is by trying to limit the um, amount that comes in through these. And you might think, well, what's the point of that? Why, why do we need to limit it? Um, but anything which comes in through our six senses um, affects our mind you know, to the smallest extent or a greater extent. So we try to limit the amount that these things come in our minds, limit the amount that they draw the mind out, that they stir up and agitate the mind. Um, and so, uh, uh, so yeah, we, so we limit, we limit what comes in through this. So as for monks, we have a lot of rules in our, our set of monastic rules in our vinya that specifically address this. You know, we're not allowed to listen to music. We don't go to shows. Um, we only eat once a day. Again, you know, it's not expecting lay people to, to follow these when they're practicing, but we, we specifically have rules to limit the amount of sense impingement we have and limit the amount that it stirs up our mind. But of course, um, uh, living, living life, you have to have sense contact. You know, you can't, you can't just live sense life without any type of sense contact and just completely cutting off one of the senses isn't going to cut off the kilesas. So Lumpur Cha would tell a story about this, you know, to try to, when he was going through his practice, he tried to play around with this. You know, he packed his ears full of, I think it was some type of wax, so that would cut off all the hearing. And, um, and after doing this, he realized that, well, you know, the, the defilements, the greed, hatred, and delusion, you know, they don't, they don't arise at the ears, they arise in our minds and in our hearts. So just by cutting off one sense doesn't um, cut off our kilesas, you know. It's not that people who, you know, are blind don't have kilesas or people who are deaf don't have kilesas. Um, but to, to develop our meditation, we do try to limit what comes in through our senses. But since we can't, uh, we still live in the world and we still have to contact the world, um, we are still gonna be using our senses. So what we have to do is what's called guarding the sense doors. So this is um, establishing mindfulness at all of our senses and mindfulness when we do um, come into contact with a uh, sense object so that we're not, what the Buddha said, grasping at its signs and features. So um, again, one of Lumpur Cha's stories about this was um, once some of the monks and went, uh, went to complain to him about all the sounds they heard. They were trying to meditate and there was all this sound. And you know they're like, oh, Lumpur, the, the sound is coming and it's, it's disturbing us. And he said, no, no, the sound's not coming in to disturb you. You're going out to disturb the sound. And so, um, so that, that was their, their minds were grasping at this, the signs and features of this. And um, so what we do is we establish our mindfulness um, so that when we do see something, you know, we don't get drawn out to it. We don't get involved in it. We don't um, uh, stir up our liking and disliking, our greed, hatred, and delusion. But, um, but this doesn't mean just like you're, you're kind of in a bit of a daze and not really registering anything which is happening. So, so we, uh, we have to uh, learn to practice like this and learn to uh, restrain our senses. And the, uh, the next one we have is called Bojene uh, Matanyuta. So this is moderation in eating. <clears throat> and um, so this is, it's not starving yourself, but this is finding um, the right amount to of food that's gonna um, put us in the zone and like maximize our mindfulness. Because what you find is when you overeat, your mind becomes dull. Um, it's harder to establish mindfulness. You know, when different um, mind states, different moods, different kilesas, defilements come up, it's much harder for us to get rid of them. And we find the opposite when we uh, don't eat enough. Um, you know, a lot of times we can get irritable, cranky. You know, it, it's, we don't have enough effort, energy to put forth effort into our practice. Um, so for us, we're trying to find that balance between um, eating enough so we have the energy to practice but not overeating so that our mindfulness is weaker, that we're, we're, um, that we, uh, we're gonna be dull and not practice so well. But of course, this takes time. You've gotta kind of play around with it. 
see what works, you know, um, sometimes. And the more you practice and the more you're working at the meditation, the more you'll be able to see when you have overeaten and see when you haven't eaten enough. So um, so you just, just uh, take some time, play around with it, you know, and see what works for you. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a practice that takes time. And um, <clears throat> and also really watch what kinds of what kinds of foods you're taking in as well, because you know we'll see that some foods will really affect us in different ways, um, especially you know around stuff like caffeine. You know, you'll find if you drink too much coffee, you might get really jittery, talkative. You know, you go to sit and meditate, and your mind's running a mile a minute. So, um, or some people find that with sugars. You know, some people find certain foods make them dull and sleepy. You know, um, where I ordained in Northeast Thailand, um, the staple food of that part of the country is sticky rice. So this is this very heavy, glutinous rice. And um, if you eat too much of this, you get really, really tired. <laughs> so, so you've got to watch how much you eat of that. And, or, or at least when you do eat it, make sure you do a lot of walking meditation afterwards. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so you, you really want to watch and learn from, and watch your body and mind and see how it works with that. Um, and then uh, uh, the next one is Jagarianu Yoga, which is uh, devotion to wakefulness. And so again, this one can be split into two different, um, two different parts. So one is um, getting the right amount of sleep, and the second one would be um, what we're doing with our minds when we are awake and we're not sleeping. So, uh, so uh, getting the right amount of sleep. If we, one of the things we find, if you oversleep, um, the mind it becomes dull. Um, it becomes uh, really hard to. Uh, establish mindfulness or any quality of mindfulness and at least for me I find makes me really moody you know uh, worse than undersleeping and uh, and so, and so you'll find when you go to meditate you know you'll be dull and sometimes you can get this just um, when you've overslept this like deep tiredness that you just can't seem to shake and and just instinctively you think okay I, I'm really tired this must mean I don't ha I haven't slept enough I need to go sleep more which of course is just gonna uh, just deepen this like uh, tiredness, deep tiredness you have. Um, but on the other side, if you don't sleep enough, um, you know, you can get really irritable. Uh, it can be uh, very difficult to establish mindfulness. You know, you can't really focus on what you're doing. And uh, a lot of times, a lot of people, when they don't sleep enough, can get very sensitive. So um, at the monastery I ordained at, um, we have this practice of one day a week, um, we stay up all through the night practicing. So we'd all sit together in, in the sala or the meditation hall, and we'd meditate and practice throughout the night. And then the next day, when that's finished, you know, we go out on our alms round, and then you know have the meal, and then go back to our kutis. But the monastery, we have a rule, because the monastery I come from is a training monastery. So there's a lot of, you know, teaching and instructing and and mutual admonishment. Like you know, if someone does something, you know, you point it out to them. Um, but we have this rule, the day after we stay up all night, you're not allowed to admonish anyone at all, not allowed to point out things people do wrong, because it can get ugly, <laughs> you know, so, um, so, uh, so yeah, so when we're practicing, except for cases like that, where we do intentionally push ourselves to stay up all, right, all night, we want to find what's the, um, kind of the optimal amount of sleep we can get, you know, where we're, we're not falling into uh, overtiredness, and we're not uh, uh, getting dull from sleeping too much. But then the other thing we want to do is actually when we are awake is to really be awake and to actually have mindfulness established throughout the day. So um, uh, in the beginning for me when I started practicing, um, I got right away into books um, like the biography of Lung Por Man, who is the uh, founder of the Thai forest tradition, and books by Lung Tam Mahabua, who is... Um, one of his uh, most famous disciples. And these, their style of practice and their style of teaching is really macho. And at the time, I didn't realize how, what a high level of practice it was. So for, for continuing and being mindful all the time, they said just mentally recite Budo all the time. And so I tried this, you know, when I was a Pakawan novice, I would try this. And 
they talk about when they start doing it, they would just do it for the rest of their lives and their practice would all was always good and their meditation kept getting better. And when I'd try it, it would last, you know, maybe 30 seconds. And then, you know, five or 10 minutes later, I'd realize I'd completely lost it and been thinking. And I'd get really down and get really hard on myself. Like, oh, I'm a terrible novice. I'm never going to be any good at this. I'm never going to learn how to meditate. But what I didn't realize was that these are like the elite of the elite. They're like the Navy SEALs of Buddhist monks, right? So it's, uh, so, so uh, you know, I, I, I was just a beginner at the time. I can't practice like a Navy SEAL, right? And so, um, so what I did for to uh, try to keep mindfulness going throughout the day and to get a continuous mindfulness was to break my day up into sections. So of course, living in the monastery is very easy to do that. So, you know, I'd break up a section of um, walking from my kuti to the, or like my hut to the sala or the meditation hall in the morning. I'd break up a section doing sweeping in the morning, um, break up another section of when I'm walking on Bindabat each day and view each one of these sections as its own um, like a meditation period or its own meditation session and find a specific uh, technique of, of maintaining mindfulness that suited this particular time. So for example, like walking on Bindabat, I would count my steps. And, uh, and, in, and you know, it sounds, sounds simple, but one of the things, it, it prevents, it keeps the mind there, it keeps the mind in the moment and prevents it from going off and proliferating and thinking and creating problems. And um, the more you do these and the more you do it over time, you'll uh, really start to learn about yourself and learn about your mind. Because say, for example, with the, um, with the counting your steps, you know, some days, oh, it's super easy. You know, you find it easy. Your mind really wants to stay with it. But then other days, um, you, you find your mind struggling. And so you have to really put more effort to keep it, keep it on that counting. And then um, there's other days where you just completely lose it. And no matter how hard you're, you're trying, your mind's just going off other places. So over time, you really start to learn about your mind and learn about what it does. And... Um, so when we start when we start practicing these, we start practicing like this. Um, uh, the, our practice becomes very holistic. You know, it's, it's our entire life. Can we, we, if we choose, we can involve as much of our life as we want in the practice. So, um, so for a lot of people, especially you know people who have responsibilities, you know, working jobs, having families, you know, sometimes there's that feeling of um, I want to practice more, but I only have this much amount of time to do sitting meditation or only, you know, I only have so much spare time. But when you're practicing like this, practicing sense restraint, practicing um, moderation in eating, practicing uh, devotion to wakefulness and trying to keep continuous mindfulness, you can be practicing it at any time in the day and anywhere you are. There's, when I um, was a junior monk at Wat Panana Chat, there was a big sign up in, in the, the forest, um, this quote by Lung Por Cha, which said, you know, if you have time to breathe, you have time to meditate. And um, during my fifth panza, my fifth rains retreat as a monk, uh, Lung Por Biak came to visit. And he's a very senior, very respected uh, disciple of Lung Por Cha. And he, uh, he speaks perfect English. He did his master's in New York. And so um, <laughs> he, uh, we were, we, myself, Lumpur Biak, and, and the abbot of Wat Nanachat, Ajahn Kavli, were, were driving through the parking lot and saw this sign. And Lumpur Biak pointed it out to Ajahn Kavli, and he said, that sign's not correct. He said, that's not what Lumpur Cha said. He said, it's not if you have time to meditate, you have time, uh, if, sorry, if, it's not if you have time to breathe, you have time to meditate. He said, what he actually said is, if you have time to breathe, you have time to practice, because a lot of the practices we do aren't just the formal meditation. So uh, again, it, like the example I gave in the beginning, it's kind of like an athlete. So um, at certain points they are in the gym exercising, but um, what they do in the rest of their life is really gonna maximize the results um, practicing in the gym. So um, uh, I'd maybe like to offer this to everyone for a bit of reflection today, just a bit of uh, the teachings that we get a lot in, in the monasteries in Thailand. So anyone?
Thank you, uh, John. Um, so yeah, now we'll have a period of questions, and people who are here can just raise your hand, and we've got a microphone, and um, yeah, people here can ask, and we've got people on Zoom as well. Uh, if you have a question on Zoom, just uh, raise your fleshy hand or the little upper right-hand corner hand, and uh, we'll call on you. So yeah, Ajahn Nisibo really does have a lot of experience uh, in meditation and staying with uh, a number of really good teachers. So, Nando, thank you. <laughs> I've been doing that for the last three days. Um, we do know each other. Uh, we lived together for quite some time. But uh, yeah, please. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, I, thanks for the talk. Um, I had one question. Um, about the sense restraint, uh, are there any concrete like practices you can recommend to for lay people to, to kind of practice that? Well, um, of course, uh, having the the guarding the sense doors, you know, trying to have mindfulness. Well, well, you're doing things, but again, um, it's not. You know, when we have mindfulness, we always use like uh, in in especially in the suttas. Uh, the words sati and sampajanya always come together. So just to be aware that you're, um, you still have to have this all around uh, clear comprehension and all around knowing. So um, again, you're not just, it's not just you're like um, in some kind of like zoned out thing. And yeah, I'm just not, not allowing my mind to attach to these things because you know, you still, you're still functioning in the world, right? So it's like, if you're driving your car, you know, you're not just, I'm being super mindful and not paying attention to what's happening around you. Um, but say for sense restraint, you know, um, just be aware, you know, because in the beginning, a lot of these things, um, there's a learning process. So it's not like when we, we start off uh, right away, there's um, an exact amount of what to do and exactly what to do, because we're all different. And, um, and as our practices change, the way we do these things is going to change. So, um, so you know, you can limit stuff like and just watch like, okay, if I go and I watch a movie in the theaters, or I, I guess streaming now, do they still have theaters? <laughs> I've been in Thailand a long time. <laughs> um, uh, it's uh, uh, how does this affect my mind afterwards? So you you can even you can even play around just um, so you can see it firsthand. Like what do I do and what does it affect me afterwards? So you go out and w watch a action movie or something, and then you go and try to sit and meditate. You know, you'll see your mind is just stirred up. All the, the images, all the sounds, all the action is really stirs you up. So just, just when you see these things which are doing that, try to, try to, uh, try to reduce them, you know? And, um, and yeah, and again, it takes time. And so just um, be kind to yourself when you're doing it. Sometimes we get these really strong expectations. Like, you know, we, we try to jump in and go, you know, at you know, 100 miles an hour right away when it's like, actually, you know, we just, just take it gradually. But it's the but it's the same with the the other ones. You know, there is no set amount. So like, for um, uh, moderation and eating, there's no set amount that we have to eat. Like the Buddha didn't say um, you can only eat ten mouthfuls or twenty mouthfuls of food, or you can only eat this one type of food. And so, because everyone's different, everyone's body's different. So you have to you have to play around with a bit and see what works for you, and what works for you now can change over time. So for example, um, you know, you need uh, this amount to eat. This is this is what kind of works for you. Um, but you might be doing some a lot more physical activity, heavier work, more more physical activity. So you might need more food to eat then. Or with sleep, the same thing, you know, you might find this is the, the right amount of sleep, which is working for me right now. But then your meditation starts getting better. And you start needing less sleep. Or maybe you do something like uh, physically strenuous, again, physical activity, exercise, work. Um, so you might need a little more sleep or you're not feeling well, like you're sick, you've caught, caught a cold or something. You might need a little more sleep for the recovery. So um, so again, these things, it's it's not like a set, like real um, outlined like science like that. It's a bit more of an art where you've got to kind of be flexible and flow, you know? Thank you. No problem. So I have a question about um, guarding the sense doors. As, um, in <clears throat> my practice, it's um, I have a run a business. I have a really full lay life, 
And I find that when I go out into nature or in my garden, I actually encourage more of the inputs into sight and sound and smell to keep me more balanced from getting worked up about, you know, the, the next to-do thing I have. And um, I, it feels like I'm not guarding my sense doors. I'm actually inviting more input. But I find that I've been doing that to create more balance and perspective. So I, I don't know whether that's what you would say around that. Well, um, with, with those, look at the way it, with, it's affecting you. So, you know, you're going out into nature. Again, you know, having, you know, some trees around, maybe some birds, you know, um, that's, that's not necessarily something which is going to be, um, like, negatively stimulating you, right? So it's not like, again, like comparing it to, say, an action movie. You know, when, you, when you've sat out in nature and been able to relax, you know, and then you go and sit and meditate, you know, how is your mind you know, versus say, you know, you, you went out and, um, yeah, went on some great adventure or something and you came back and your mind's all stirred up. And even for monks, you know, the, uh, the Thai forest tradition, we, we live out in nature, you know, because it does have this calming effect on you. So it's, um, it's one of the things you see living in the forest, especially in Thailand, it's not quiet. It's not quiet at all. You've got animals, you've got, you know, the, the cicadas, which have this, like, I don't know, this, like, high pitched so I don't even know what you call it like buzz or something and um so so it's not it's not quiet but it's peaceful and that that having that natural thing is peaceful and a lot of people um will find especially when they they go to meditate you know a lot of times we think you know just jump right into the breath right you know sit down boom just on the breath but a lot of people find that say being aware of hearing being aware of these things first actually helps them ground their mindfulness in the present moment and so um yeah, it's almost like a preparatory thing for it. So, thank you. Oh, hello. Um, so my question is also about sense restraint. Um, I find what's hard is at the end of a day when you um got back from work, you had accumulate so much, not so much, but you have accumulate frustration and um, just this desire to, to, to indulge in TV or music because as the day progressed, um, these little micro frustrations start to build up. Um, and when I get home, the first thing I want is just to be on my couch and watch TV. Um, so what's your advice? And um, I do think one thing that helped is to remind me that indulging in TV is not going to make me feel any better. So, but I want to prevent it earlier. Well, yeah, that, that's a very important thing is um, the first part, like in life, like, you know, throughout our days and especially, you know, for monks, it's a little easier because we, we, we don't have that much we have to deal with. But, you know, for lay people, like living living in the world and having jobs and stuff like this, like you're saying, you can build up a lot of frustrations, a lot of um, all, all these these uh, negative emotions and uh, throughout the day. And it is important that at the end of the day that you're, um, able to let them go and you want to be able to let all of them go um, because if you can only let go 95% of it you know you have 5% left and then tomorrow you can only let go of 95% of what you built up then now you've got 10% and over time it's gonna it's gonna build up and build up and then you know you're gonna have a problem or it's gonna have some negative effect on you so it is important to find a way to um, relax and let go of that um, but uh, but again, like we um, we want our letting go to not be dependent, so dependent on something external. And if you're able to find find a way to let go internally, like say do maybe do something a little physical, or you know try doing some 
uh, we would recommend some meditation or some chanting or something to to just calm your mind down. But again, this is one of those things you're going to have to find some kind of skillful mean that works for you specifically. And um, yeah, and and uh, and play around over time, uh, do trial and error. See, you know, if um, okay, come back from home from work. You're tired. You're frustrated. And you go and sit on the couch and watch TV and just see, okay, how do I feel afterwards? Um, what, how, how has this changed um, my frustration levels? How has this changed my agitation levels? And then try with something different the next day. Okay, I'm going to try to sit meditation for a bit afterwards and see uh, how this affects my frustration levels. And you can compare them. And it might be like, okay, so... After work, you might not be able to just jump in to meditate right away. You know, again, it might be uh, going from like, you know, a hundred miles an hour to stopping right away. You know, it's it's you maybe need to slow down and find something like, you know, maybe doing some physical activity or something to slow down. Some yoga, go for a walk, you know, something like that. But uh, just just play around with it. Try different different techniques and and compare how they they affect you and your mind. Can I follow up real quick? Sorry, my yeah, question yeah, yeah. <laughs> wasn't super clear. Um, what I meant is by the end of the day, um, I do sit down, meditate, and um, let that frustration go. But my question was really about during the day at work, how do I stop this frustration to build up so that I don't have to deal with the consequence of that? Oh, oh, at the end of the day. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, uh, so one of the things is, yeah, just keeping your, your mindfulness going and watching these mind states when they start coming up. Because whenever one of these uh, negative mind states comes up, um, you know, a frustration, you get a little irritated at someone you're working with or someone you're dealing with, um, uh, it usually starts small. But the more we... Uh, proliferate on it, the more we think about it, the more we let it fester, um, the bigger it gets, the more of a problem it gets. So what we need to do is try try to get rid of those as as quickly as possible. And um, uh, I don't know if Seattle gets much snow. I was just in Canada, so it's the only place I can kind of use this uh, simile. You know, it's like when you're driving in wintertime <laughs> and uh, driving in the snow and uh, there are these ruts in the snow, and the more you you uh, drive in these ruts, the deeper they get, and the more and easier they pull your car into it. And a lot of our mind states are the same way. The more we think like that, and the more we go in this direction, or the more we feed these certain thoughts and feelings, the more our mind is going to go towards them. And the deeper it is, and the harder it is to is pull our mind out of that. So what we have to do is um, one have the mindfulness to see when when these frustrations are starting these irritations are starting and then we have to um use some of these uh tools there are a lot of different tools and techniques that we can use to get rid of these mind states or deal with these mind states and so it's it's important for us to uh develop a few of them and uh and have really really practiced them and because what works for us today might not work tomorrow and so once once something does uh, come up, to start uh, trying to let go of it as quick as possible. And then I, I don't know the nature of, of your work, but one of the other things you could try doing is if you get if you get time every now and then to just take a few minutes to just you know establish mindfulness, just mindfulness in your body. Just be aware of where you're at, where your body's at, where your mind's at, and just you know um, take a couple of minutes to maybe just try to cool it down, calm down for a bit. But um, that really depends on um, uh, the nature of your work, you know, if you have time to do that. So did you uh, say the third one is devotion? Devotion to wakefulness. Oh, to wakefulness. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's like um, one part is making sure that um, uh, we we uh, get the right amount of sleep for us, and so that we're not overtired from oversleep, or we're not um, weak mindfulness and irritable and from undersleep.
Thank you, Bhante. Um, my question is about this idea of breaking up the day into different kind of segments and having a technique that sort of aligns with that, and then how you would define like working. What, how, do you, how, how would you decide, oh, this technique is working? Because it seems like when I sit and, okay, I'm using a particular technique and I slide into boredom, well, there's an opportunity to learn about boredom or there's an opportunity to switch techniques and try something different. So I wonder if you might speak to that a little bit. Um, so uh, for, for once throughout the day, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, you, you uh, find, find a technique which works based on, say, you know, the activity. So say something like walking. You know, it's very easy to do something which involves, you know, the feet, you know, walking, uh, that awareness of the walking. Um, but sometimes also, you know, say, you know, you're uh, about, like, say for monks, you know, in the morning when, you know, we wake up quite early and then we, you know, walk to the meditation hall and practice together. So sometimes, you know, what you'll do is, or what I'll do is um, practice loving kindness meditation then, because, you know, you're bound, to, you're bound to encounter everyone for the day. So it's better to start off with a little, you know, loving kindness in your bank and, uh, and just in case there is something which comes up, you know, and makes you a little more pleasant to be around. <laughs> but, um, but uh, again, with, with judging if these things work or not, it's, um, you have to give it time. So you have, to, you have to work at something for a bit. It's not just, um, oh, I tried that once and it's, uh, it didn't work. So it'd be like if, say, you were trying to learn, learn to play basketball and you went in and you threw your basketball and it misses the hoop complete and you're, and you're like, oh, well, I tried basketball. I'm no good at it, right? But you want to go back and try again and again. And, and over time, as you work at it, you'll develop that skill. Um, but yeah, sometimes um, when I was uh, staying with Lumpur Biak, because I had heard before that um, when you're, say, when you're meditating, you know, you should just always try to stick to the same meditation object. And when I stayed with Lumpur Biak, I asked him this and he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, is it okay, you know, if, if I've been doing, you know, say breath meditation for a long time and I'm having hard to keep my mindfulness on that and keep that going, is it okay if I switch it and do loving kindness meditation? He's like, yeah, of course, you know, <laughs> like it was like I was asked the stupidest question, right? But, but um, yeah, so if, if you're not able to, because you want to you maintain that mindfulness, right? But, but again, this is one where you, you, you have to really be honest with yourself and see when is it I'm just switching back and forth and I'm not you know, trying to, to push through and develop this meditation technique. Um, actually, just a, a few days ago when I was at uh, visiting Ajahn Sona's monastery up in Canada, one of the, uh, the lay people out there asked me you know, what quality I've seen or, or teaching I've seen that um, I think was the most important for us or one of the most important for us in practice. And for me, it's, it's right away, it's Sacha Barami. Um, usually Satcha is translated as truthfulness, but um, I think um, I, I, I prefer the translation honesty. If you want the really deep poly translation, Ajahn Kovalo can help you out with that. But, um, um, uh, and, and this is this really being honest with ourselves. Uh, and it can be very difficult because, you know, we have these certain ideas about ourselves, where we think we are, where we think we should be. And, um, but just being really honest with ourselves in our practice, you know, where, where am I practicing? So like my example earlier when I was uh, trying to practice the, just the Budo practice, like, you know, Lung for Man and stuff, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm not there. You have to be honest, like this, this isn't working for me. This is, this is above what I'm able to do right now. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it's, just, it's just a really important quality to develop. There was that really great quote of um, Mei Chi Gao in her biography. And uh, I forget the whole quote, but the essence was, you know, you can lie to the whole world if you want, but never lie to yourself. And so this is this is very, very important for us, but again, can be very difficult, you know. Thank you. Uh, no problem. One more. Sure. Thank you, Bhante. I want to you to touch upon the second uh, thing that you talked about eating moderately. I know uh, monks like you uh, eat only one uh, meal a day. Uh, can laymen also try to do it? And how do laymen try to get into, say, eating one meal a day? And how, it, how does it affect the layman activities and also the meditation? Right. Uh, my, my hearing is really bad, so I just have to <laughs> double check sometimes. Um, 
Uh, yeah, it's absolutely possible for a lay person to eat one meal a day. Um, for us as monks, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's just uh, in, at least in Thailand, really with the Thai forest tradition, um, part of our practice is eating the one meal a day. It's not, it's not all Buddhist monks have to. The Buddha d um, allowed the monks to eat from any time between dawn and when the sun reaches its zenith. So we usually take it noon. Um, but but for, the, for us, we eat the one meal a day. Um, it's easier for monks to do it than for lay people. Not, not discouraging you from doing it. Like, you know, if you'd like to go for it, but, um, for us, it, it's a lot easier because we only, there's only food in the monastery at one time a day. You know, it's, you know, we, we eat our meal, we put our bowls away and there's no opportunity at all to eat, you know, so the, the, the temp temptation isn't there as much. Like, um, I remember when I was a layman, um, uh, I was trying to keep the eight precepts as a, as a lay person. And I found that much more difficult to keep the eight precepts as a lay person than the 227 as a monk because <laughs> because everyone around you is practicing it you know and and like i said you know if, if you're a monk and you want to break the rules you've actually kind of got to go out of your way to do it you've got to make an effort to break them whereas you know in lay life you know being around people who are all eating dinner and and stuff like this um it's more difficult but if you'd like to um yeah yeah go for it you know um, give it a try. You know, I'm not at all trying to discourage you, but um, uh, but yeah, the um, just make sure um, when you do it, uh, see see you know how it works for you. Make sure you eat enough or not too much, and just again, it takes time. In the beginning, what you see is um, you always see it when people come and stay at the monastery when they first arrive and start eating the one meal a day. For at first, their weight drops and they'll lose like seven to ten kilos, usually fairly quickly. Um, but then what happens is your metabolism gets used to it and starts stabilizing and then, you know, they'll start gaining the weight back. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of, it's pretty normal. You see it, everyone who comes and stays in the monastery.